Good evening, I'm Joe Holder, pastor of Little Zion Primitive Baptist Church in Bellflower, California. <laughs> Pardon my beginning frown, I had a little hiccup with my tablet before, or just as we were starting, but uh, hopefully things are working now and I look forward to a time of helpful and hopefully edifying study together with, with you this evening. Hope you'll be prayerful for the Lord to bless and guide our minds together in a fruitful study of His Word. If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, we'll be looking at some verses this evening in Revelation chapter 19. I give the title to this evening's message, Our God, Faithful and True. Let's begin now with a good hymn. enjoyed that hymn so much I had to sing along. I hope you enjoyed it too. We appreciate your, your joining with us today and thank you and we're thankful to the Lord for your interest and desire to join with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for today, for rich blessings and kindness. We, we become complacent and, and so self-focused sometimes that we we ignore or even fail to see the blessings that surround us. In Scripture, you described us as standing in grace, and yet we only have access to that grace wherein we stand by faith. Faith that focuses on you and not on ourselves. Faith that honors you as Lord, God, and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings give us the grace and the wise, faithful insight to see the blessings and not become distracted by the unbelief that is so rampant in the world around us. We pray for our country and for healing. We pray for those affected by the virus, and we especially pray for the manufacture and distribution of the vaccine so that more and more people can gain some uh, immunity to it and 
and be more secure in going about their daily routines. Thank you, Father, for rich blessings. Bless us now as we turn to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Since we're studying in the book of Revelation this evening, I, I want to spend a few minutes in the beginning to frame some, I believe, significant and necessary thoughts about the character of the book of Revelation and the right way to go about studying and interpreting it. Sad to say, so much of what you hear taught uh, from the book of Revelation today is so speculative and so bizarre that it, 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 it turns more people off to Christianity then turns them on because people will make all of these wild interpretations of Revelation and the common hearer will pick up his Bible and read it and think, where did he get that? I must be a lost cause. I'll just give up and not try. And away they go. Let's, let's try to focus. And I want to, to, to anchor those thoughts. Have you look at Revelation chapter 1 and Verse 1, I'll read it. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it, spoke by signs, by his angel unto his servant John. Revelation was written as an apocalyptic literary genre. Ancient writings of this particular genre were typically written to a people under intense and formidable pressure and assault. They, they were overwhelmed by their enemies, and it seemed, barring an absolute miraculous delivery, they were soon destined to be destroyed and annihilated. The writer of this genre would send these people a letter or write a story to them and he would remind them of an unknown or not considered hero who would come in often at the last moment with amazing supernatural power, deliver them, destroy their enemy, and restore their security. Around 89 AD, I believe John wrote his Revelation letter late in the first century, probably in the 90s. <clears throat> I wouldn't go so far as to name a, a, day, a, a particular year, but I believe in the 90s at least. Around 89 AD, Christians in the Roman Empire were subjected to a fierce persecution by the Roman emperor of the time, Domitian. They were accused of being atheist and just devastated with the persecution. Why were they called atheists? Because they refused to worship the Roman emperor. They had a god already. They had a king already. They couldn't worship the false king, the false, the false ruler. They needed news of a deliverer who was greater than Domitian. They needed an apocalyptic reminder to them of something incredible and wonderful. Before, I'm, I'm going to give you about uh, six or seven basic guidelines for interpreting Revelation. But before I do that, let's look simply at the first verse of the book. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Very simply, the, the whole message of Revelation is not about fierce animals of, of sometimes hybrid qualities that, that are just frightening beyond human words. It's not written about false prophets with amazing powers. It, it's, it's written to keep our minds focused on Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's written to servants, his servants. Revelation is not a book written to unbelievers to frighten them into faith. It's a book written to believers to comfort them and to assure them against the adversaries they face 
in their faith. First of all, the um, basic genre of the apocalyptic literary writing was in fact written in symbols or in a code language. The adversary might see the writing and think it was so full of symbolism and religious hobble gobble, hobble -gobble that it, it didn't mean anything so who cares if they read it or not. It doesn't mean anything anyway. The uh, people who received it and the author who wrote it to them would carefully select broad symbols that the people who received the letter would understand and would get the message that was intended. And so that's the, the very intent of the letter. This particular code or these symbols were to be interpreted in a very broad, general sense and in a very simple sense. If they're under persecution and possibly under military assault 24 hours a day, they don't have time to sit down and analyze and come up with some wild, complex, convoluted theory of interpretation that, that it takes a rocket scientist to understand and explain. They need a simple explanation that gets to the bottom line in a big hurry. It's Jesus Christ revealed. Keep that in mind. Also, in that first verse, John is told or tells us that what he was given was about things which must shortly come to pass. Not things in the remote end times, although John will, in the end, remind us and give us his depiction of the second coming, but the majority by far of the entire book is written, I believe, to believers about issues they will be facing in their discipleship in the here and now. And so any interpretation of revelation that focuses on beast or false prophets or complex, long, remote, end-time fulfillment and fails to comfort those first century saints who first received this letter, fails the hermeneutical test, fails the edification test, should not be accepted or believed. If it comforted those first century believers, it should comfort believers who are troubled and, and under stress and pressure in any period of time. And finally, this book contains the same truth that is revealed in all of the other letters of the New Testament. It doesn't teach us a different message or a different gospel. In interpreting scripture, a basic rule of sound and wise interpretation is that you study the literal teachings, the literal passages, get a firm anchor of understanding of those passages, and then you interpret the symbolic according to what you have already come to understand of the literal. Don't forget this broad historical and, and broad symbolic perspective. Most sermons I have heard in my life, and, and whether on the radio from a variety of denominational preachers or even at times within my own fellowship, have interpreted the symbols of Revelation as if the book was an allegory. Every fine detail means this. It's, it's like uh, Pilgrim's Progress, for example, where everything takes on a symbolic meaning. That's the mere opposite of the intent and the design of the apocalyptic literary genre. In the, in the literary genre of apocalypsis, apocalyptic writing, you look at broad general symbols and, and messages, not this finite detail. If we look at historical interpretations of the book of Revelation, and this is not original with me. I, I picked this up several years ago from some commentary. I don't recall who now. In peaceful times, when everything's going well for Christians, 
Christians interpret revelation in mystical allegory complexities and speculative interpretations. In times of intense persecution, they interpret the book as it should be interpreted, focus on Jesus the Deliverer, and look in the, at the big picture of the book for a simple message of deliverance. Jesus wins. That's the message of Revelation. If you're interested in reading books written about the book of Revelation, commentary type books, I would recommend two. One uh, by Leon Morris, the Tyndale New Testament Commentary Book of Revelation, and another by uh, a man named Ray Summers, Worthy is the Lamb. They're both brief, they're both simple, they both focus on the simple message of Jesus wins, not the complexities that confuse and bewilder people that you often hear in today's world. Now let's go to chapter 19 and look at the passage I really wanted us to consider this evening. We begin with verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. You notice in almost all of John's visions in Revelation, he is here on earth and he is enabled by the Spirit to look into heaven. It's always open. It's never closed. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse, a very strong symbol in the first century of victory. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. There's the title of tonight's message. Our God, faithful and true. You find this, these same descriptive names given to Jesus in Revelation 3 verse 14, the angel's message to the church, at, or to the angel of the church at Laodicea. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the so be it, this is the way it is, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The, all of the verbs in this sentence are either past or present tense. I saw he that sat on the throne was called, was called. He doth judge and make war. This is present tense and past tense. He's seeing something that's going on at the time he writes. He's not seeing something necessarily that is being uh, suspended until the final moment. The tense describes the abiding character of the one who sat on the throne. This is a defining mark of who he is and what he does and how he does it. He is always faithful always true, and always righteous. He is no other under any circumstance. Whether we consider Jesus or God himself in the present temporal judgments of chastening or of providence in his dealings with people in this world, or whether we think of him and his role in that last epical judgment at the second coming, his judgment is always and only righteous. Verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. The description of his eyes is very similar to John's description that he gives us in the first chapter, when, when he saw the glorified Jesus speaking to him. Notice very carefully the description of his eyes. They were as a flame of fire. The human eye is constructed to receive incoming light waves and transmit those images by the optic nerve to the brain where those images are interpreted and we respond to them. 
light comes into the eye and is trans uh, translated by the brain. His eyes emit light. They don't receive, they emit. They shine in every dark corner of the secrets of man's minds. There is nothing hidden from his perspective and view. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 gives us a powerful description in inspired language of this point. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. His eyes pierce every obstacle man raises to hide himself or his sins from God. There is no hiding place from God. He had a name written that no one knew but he himself. This is a reminder. As, as intimately as we can become with our knowledge of Jesus in the teachings and writings of the New Testament, and the unfolding and unpacking of those truths in the gospel, we can only learn and know so much about him. We need to accept that reality and make up our minds early in life to be a lifetime student of Jesus. When we check out, no matter how old, we could check out at 100 years old, and if we studiously examine the scriptures and our Lord that entire time, when we check out, there's still a name that we don't know. But we know some things about him, and they tell us what we need to know today. Verse 13, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So not only is he called faithful and true, He's now called the Word of God. Let's look first at the, the first part of the verse. He's clothed with uh, whatever clothing he is wearing, dipped in blood. The big question for us, and it's con confusingly examined and debated among commentaries, whose blood was his clothing dipped in? His blood or his enemy's blood? His own blood would point us to Calvary and his victory over the sins of his people by his blood being shed at Calvary. The symbolism is the giving of his life in crucifixion. His enemy's blood would be a symbol of his final and decisive victory over all his enemies. And so it would be their blood. Commentaries disagree. They, 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 they fall all over the field on interpreting this in one or the other of the directions. Probably more contemporary commentaries lean toward the enemy's blood. Some of the older commentaries lean more toward his own blood. I think I like the older ones better, but let's be, let's be kind toward all and let's agree, can we not? with the facts of what Jesus has done and who he is, that both are true. He did, in fact, destroy our sins by his death on, at Calvary. And at the second coming, when he comes back and judges, he shall deliver his people to glory, the product of his death for them, and he shall gain the final victory over all of his and our enemies. In, in addition to faithful and true, we have the new name or the additional name, the Word of God. The Word of God in Hebrews 4.12, just one verse prior to the verse I read, Hebrews 4.13, the Word of God is quick and powerful and so on. The Word of God in Hebrews 4.12 is Jesus the same as it is here in Revelation 19 verse 13. It's Jesus himself, not Scripture. Scripture bears witness of him as the Word of God. It is not 
that personal living word. Everything, everything, my friends, that God wants to communicate of himself to us, he communicates in the person of Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul makes this point in the first two verses of the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, different times, different ways, spake in times time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. God has spoken to us the, the, the word of God, the communicating message from God to us is all summed up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who are these people? They're described as an army. They are described as being in heaven. But linen is not the wardrobe of a soldier ready to do battle. Who are these people? Is it redeemed saints who have died and their spirits are in heaven now? Or is it angels? I lean specifically toward the belief that it's redeemed saints. And I'll give you some of my reasons for believing that. In verse 8 in this chapter, the bride of Christ is described as dressed in linen. That was what that was the, the cloth that, of their wedding garment. In addition, the clothing, the garments the priest wore when they officiated as priest in the tabernacle or temple in the Old Testament worship was linen. So priest in the Old Testament wore linen garments, and the bride at the wedding supper or the, the, the wedding feast of the Lamb were dressed in linen. Let me give you a couple of passages. You have chapter 1, verse 6 in Revelation. Hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. A similar expression in chapter 5, verse 10 of Revelation. And I'll read one additional verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Royal priesthood, both kings and priests. And verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. I believe the primary reference of this verse is, in fact, to the second coming and the final judgment. In the final judgment, according to everything we have of that event described in Scripture, he shall judge the wicked, and in the sense they are judged, more uh, a welcoming uh, message than a judgment of sorts to the righteous, to the saved. He will judge them with his words, that sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. Consider the sheep-goat analogy of Matthew chapter 25 that describes his conduct during the second coming. In verse 34 and again in verse 30 or 41, then shall the king say, he speaks to the righteous, he speaks to the wicked, and pronounces the blessing and the judgment on each. And they, 
Oh, today, wicked people mock God. They ridicule him. They despise him. Folks, on that day, you get their attention. They shall bow under the iron sword that rules them. It will not be, uh, an if, if iffy or maybe so, maybe not idea. Of this particular verse, in, in that Tyndale commentary I mentioned earlier, Leon Morris draws this concluding paragraph to the lesson we've been studying here in chapter 19. It's a beautiful description. Let me share it with you. The great victory has been won. The power of evil has been broken. There remains only to complete the final ordering of things by putting the wicked away permanently and introducing the righteous to heaven. I say, Amen. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. You find these two terms repeated in chapter 17, verse 14, and it appeared in our last message from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. Now, we've seen a beautiful, beautiful description of Jesus in his conquering victory for his people. What are the implications for you and me as believers today of having such a Savior, such a Lord, such a King as our, as our God? Let me use and borrow the faith of Abraham himself as our example. I'll read from Romans chapter 4, verses 19 to 22, describing Abraham and his, his situation in his old age, and Sarah's, <clears throat> pardon me, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, dead to the ability to bear children, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was all able also to perform. Do you think Abraham's vision and, and belief about God lived up to the faithful and true title that he claims at the end? I would say, yes, indeed it does. That's why I chose this passage tonight. And finally, verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. This is probably one of the most misconstrued passages in the entire Bible. 99% of the time, people will quote Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and claim it was the moment of Abraham's salvation. Well, the Bible doesn't agree, and, and it, it, it just doesn't. Let me give you my reasoning. First of all, based on Hebrews 11, verse 8, Abraham started walking by faith. Not inferior faith, Hebrews 11, Hall of Fame quality of faith, when he left Ur of the Chaldees. That was some 10 to 15, probably more like 15 years prior to Genesis 15, 6. At the very latest, it occurred in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. Read from Genesis 12, and you have a five-year hiatus in Haran after he left Ur with his family. But then in Genesis 12, he even leaves that part of the family and begins his sojourn all alone. So from Genesis 12 to Genesis 15, 6, read it carefully and write down all the time markers that you see. Abraham, by the time he gets to Genesis 15, 6, has been walking by faith a good 15 years. You got to walk by faith 15 years before God saves you? 
Is that what you believe? This is not a salvation passage. It's a discipleship passage. And that's what we're seeing in Revelation. John wrote Revelation to the servants of Jesus, not to wicked people to frighten them, but to servants to comfort them. So all of this description of Abraham is to strengthen us in our weakness and to give us courage for our faith. What did Abraham do when he faced the growing realization that God's promise, though delayed, would be delivered? He's 100 years old. Sarah's 90. They're past the point of being able by their natural bodies to produce a child. What did he do? Did he look for a mystical secret them to blame or to obsess over? <laughs> we don't read of any thems in his faith narrative. The only parties to Abraham's faith narrative was Abraham and Abraham's God. He looked up. He didn't look horizontally. Abraham looked up to God. He didn't even regard his own age or Sarah's age and their aging bodies. He looked to God. Abraham understood his and Sarah's inability to bear a child, but he didn't consider those limitations. He regarded God as greater than than his and Sarah's weakness. When we look at the things around us today, are we faithful enough to think about God as greater than the obstacles we see around us? Are, are we that faithful? Folks, we need to look up to Jesus more instead of trying to find an imaginary adversary in, in humanity who hinders and seeks ill of the family of God. Where do we look in trouble? Where we look will define who we are. Where are we looking today? Let's pause from our looking around us and fussing at each other and looking for mystical, mysterious thems that are plotting bad things, and let's spend more time with our Bibles looking up. I think we'll find a lot more peace and we'll find a lot more answers that resonate with faith, the kind that Abraham and Sarah had. God bless you for studying with me this evening. I'd love the study of Abraham and when we get to the reality of the teachings and the method that we should approach in Revelation, I love studying, despite all the adversaries, Revelation teaches us two words that simply and powerfully state the reality of its message. Jesus wins. That's the gospel, my friends, and that's what we need to preach from it. God bless you. I love you. And Lord bless you during the remainder of the week. And if the Lord wills, we'll see you on Sunday morning. God bless.